We often hear about how being sustainable on Earth is important, but we have hardly ever heard about how being sustainable in space is as important and necessary. We are Julia Bastani and Paulina Umanski, and today we'll be, we'll be discussing sustainable exploration. Next slide. I'm sure you've all realized that setting foot on Mars is the goal of our generation. And not only more and more um, countries are aiming to it, let me just mention some of the most recent uh, missions like Hope Perseverance or Tianwen One, but um, the space sector is in continuous growth and more and more companies and institutions are interested in going beyond the atmosphere. Next. So in light of the fact that we are anticipating crewed missions to Mars and because of all of the environmental problems that humans have caused on Earth, we wanted to look into protecting Mars and other bodies for the sake of future exploration. So we came up with a few research questions that we wanted to look into. The first is, what protects planetary bodies and to what extent? What does it mean to be sustainable on other planets? So what kind of technologies would we use? and how can space exploration help sustainability on Earth? So we conducted a literature review in these different areas and also had discussions between Dr. Achri, Julia, and myself. So the first part, it was looking into current planetary protection policy, which really hasn't changed in the past like 50 or 60 years. So in 1958, what's known today as the International Science Council founded the Committee on Space Research known as COSPER, in order to create guidelines for those researching space. Then in 1967, the United Nations created the Outer Space Treaty, which is the only legally binding international treaty that exists that discusses any form of planetary protection. But since it was created with the goal of preserving peace in space, and not really with the goal of protecting other planets, its planetary protection part, which is Article 9, is pretty vague. So all it really says is that when we go to explore other planets, we must avoid their harmful contamination. So in 1967, COSPA read the Outer Space Treaty and decided to create policy recommendations so that other nations can have a sort of guideline for how to follow this Outer Space Treaty. But they chose to interpret this avoid their harmful contamination bit as just pertaining to biological contamination. So since then, planetary protection policy has been synonymous with preventing biological contamination between Earth and other planets. But the shortcomings of current policies are in this life bias or in the fact that the policies focus on biological contamination. And this is problematic because we need more legal guidance on how to act on other planets. There are some planetary protection issues that are just not answered by current planetary protection policies, such as can we leave trash on Mars or can we mine Olympus Mons? We just don't know what to do because there aren't any legal policies telling us what we can and can't do. So then we decided to look into sustainability as a part of planetary protection because a lot of the more recent literature has been kind of gearing towards looking at sustainability on other planets. So we thought to look into what are some of the reasons why we could consider expanding planetary protection into just general sustainability. So the first reason is protecting astrobiology and other fields. So astrobiology or life on other planets can be affected by things that aren't biological. So for example, if we leave trash on Mars or something that could accidentally end up killing microbes that we might not understand yet. And also other fields beyond astrobiology are also important, even though they're not covered by current planetary protection policies. So geology and chemistry and other scientists or other sciences might have things that they want to examine on Mars, but that's just not protected by planetary protection policies today. And it would be protected if we use sustainability or minimizing our impact on other planets to guide how we act on other planets. So the next reason is we want to be able to preserve exploration for future generations. Space exploration is beneficial for the development of economies and also for all of the scientific knowledge that we can gain from it. And we want to preserve this opportunity for future generations. So we want to explore in a sustainable manner. And the last reason is that having sustainable exploration would also be aiding sustainability on Earth. 
So the first reason is that we want to maintain a sustainable mindset wherever we go. People look up to space exploration because it's kind of the epitome of human technology and we look up to astronauts as sort of role models. And it just wouldn't make sense to have this kind of, um, to have these people and this technology that we're sending to other planets as sort of the best of humanity to not represent the kind of values that we want to have here on Earth. And the more concrete or tangible reason would be that a lot of the technologies that are used for space exploration end up with terrestrial applications. So arguably one of the goals of the space program is to help life here on Earth. So if we develop sustainable technologies for other planets, then we could eventually apply those technologies and help solve our problems here on Earth. So now my partner will be talking about these sustainable technologies. So our next step was um, technological review. We started um, researching and studying the, the sustainable technology that currently exists or has been worked on so that we could consequently get an idea of what being sustainable on Mars would look like. The first thing that we noticed while studying sustainable systems was a new definition of sustainability, which in this case means being able to get high, higher quality products and results with fewer costs. We also noticed that the main requirements for sustainable systems that were mentioned more often were flexibility, adaptability, versatility, and survivability that we gathered in the acronym FAVES, just to sum it all up. Next. So as part of, um, of our tech review, we have mentioned some experiments, studies, and tests related to sustainability that, that have been conducted on board the International Space Station, going from Earth observation to algae to the extraction of carbon dioxide from exhaust gas streams. But what we really focused on was the ISS life support system. So the oxygen generator, the carbon dioxide absorber, and the water recycler. Because we think that it will definitely be implemented in the future missions to Mars because it's basically an autonomous system based on recycling. Next. Then we, we went over some sustainable technology that's currently being worked on. So electric and solar electric propulsion, then nuclear energy compared to solar and wind energy. And finally, cyanobacteria, which also turns out having many interesting um, sustainable applications. Next. So finally, our idea of um, is that basically being sustainable on Mars means mainly being as autonomous as possible and not depend on the technology um, and not depend on the supplies coming from Earth. So this means that the future technology should focus on taking advantage on, of the resources that we can find on the planet. So water, carbon dioxide, regolith, sunlight and wind and implement sustainable systems. So that, for example, if we take um, a quantity of water, we use it in a recycling system, and this way we don't have any waste. Next slide. So from now on, our, um, okay, you can also go next as well. So from now on, our, our, um, the, the, the next thing we will do is to keep studying the matter so that we can explore how um, sustainable Mars technology can be applied or can be useful to Earth. And then based on that and based on the, um, on the technological review, our goal is that of making policy recommendations for the sustainability of future missions to space and in particular to Mars. And that's it. thank you for your attention. Thank you. We're open for questions if we have time. Yeah. Definitely time for questions. I have to say, I love the artwork in your presentation. It's spectacular. Thank you. The message of sustainability in space exploration is very strong. 
But any questions for uh, Paulina and, and Julia? If not, I have one. Um, so all of the Outer Space Treaty was written for countries as, as the main audience. And all of the policy recommendations are policies to governments. But it seems with the example of SpaceX that a lot of the shakers and movers of exploration are gonna be companies instead of countries. How, does your, how do your ideas translate to the corporate world? So the Outer Space Treaty basically says that countries are responsible for what's happening inside of the country. So in our case, the United States would be responsible for enforcing SpaceX to like to have them follow the Outer Space Treaty. So I think that's, I guess that's where the policy part comes in is that countries are agree to these policies and then agree to enforce the companies that are inside of them. But I guess that also I, I don't really have an answer to that in the case of like multinational corporations, because then there's some enforcement issues there. I don't know if that answers your question. I think it's, a, it's interesting to think about, right? I have a feeling that just for companies to be sustainable, that requires extra costs on their part. And so maybe they want to cut corners, they want to cut away the sustainability part, but yet it's so important. So it's, I, I enjoyed this thinking about it. what can we do to be proactive with companies to encourage them they, that they see an added value to their company by being more sustainable. So great presentation, very much enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you.